Hello everybody and welcome to a new series on the subject of jurisprudence. This lesson is going to take an introduction to the subject of jurisprudence, talk about some of the ways in which we define the subject, uh, some of the major theories of the subject, the importance of this subject, as well as the scope of the series that we are going to be covering over the next weeks and months um, on the Law Academy. Now, this is the first lesson to the subject of jurisprudence. Now, we are going to ask essentially the following questions, okay? We're going to be asking the first question, which is probably the most pertinent for an introduction to jurisprudence course, which is, what is jurisprudence? Um, that is something that is going to be important for, for, for us to uh, explore and examine and to, to really get our heads around at the start of this series of lessons. We're then going to talk about why jurisprudence is important. This is often a question that is asked by law students specifically. Now, because this is an open course to, uh, to for anybody who wants to have a look and, and, and to, to watch this content, this might be content that is consumed by law students. It might be con content which is con uh, consumed by uh, other students. So, for example, philosophy students. And so, as a result of this, the ways in which you view jurisprudence may be indicative of which subject you are particularly studying. Studying. For, the, for a lot of the time, and for a lot of people, uh, the subject of jurisprudence is one that is seen by at least law students as not particularly relevant or important, uh, and then at least by philosophy students is, is considered to be more important. So really, how you view jurisprudence at the outset is something that uh, can be indicative of your uh, general approach. Now, in, as a result of that, I would encourage anybody and everybody who is watching this lesson who is studying or maybe has a background in any of these subjects to put in the comments down below straight away uh, what your initial thought process and understanding and attitude towards jurisprudence is at this early venture. Do you think that jurisprudence is important? Do you think it is uh, a, a very useful uh, and very uh, important, as I said, and vital part of study? Or do you think that it is actually useless, not important, and is just a, a tick boxing exercise that you have to do as part of your university course? I'd be very interested to see how these attitudes actually uh, lie on the kind of law versus philosophy spectrum, whether or not you're a lawyer or a philosopher. Um, and I sort of have a, an idea in the back of my mind already as to what, uh, depending on what subject you're doing, what your general approach to jurisprudence will be. We will also talk about some of the most important theories of jurisprudence, arguably the two most important theories, one of them being links to the person who is li uh, pictured at the top of the screen here. Again, for those of you who uh, uh, want to engage with this lesson in a bit more detail, put in the comments down below who the person who is uh, at the top of this um, screen actually is, uh, and I'll and I'll pin and I'll like and I'll heart the the right answer at the bottom of uh, this YouTube video. And then I'll finally think about and talk about the scope of this series, okay? So what we're actually going to be covering in this series, but also what's important as well is uh, what we're not going to be covering, what areas of uh, jurisprudence are not going to be part of the scope of this series. Let's begin. What is jurisprudence? Um, now, just like with a variety of different parts of law and different areas of philosophy, sociology, criminology, the concept of jurisprudence, in inverted commas, isn't one which is necessarily easy to define. Um, it is a thing that you study and that you understand more than a thing that you define. We can get an, ep an ep epitomological, uh, etymological uh, definition, i.e. what the word and the derivation of that word is, comes from, that doesn't necessarily give us any uh, indication as to how that word is used and how that word is defined in today's colloquial understanding of the English language. Now, things are made worse with the word jurisprudence because the word jurisprudence is often used, at least within the context of the legal tradition, uh, to refer to two different things. It can be referred to as a case law. So, for example, if I'm talking about international law, public international law, I might refer to the jurisprudence of the International Court of Justice, the ICJ. Uh, and that would be referring to the various cases and the various precedents that are established by the International Court of Justice uh, or uh, jurisprudence within 
within the context of the criminal law, within the common law jurisdiction of England and Wales. Again, that refers to case law. Uh, but that's not the kind of jurisprudence that we're going to be talking about in this series. Um, that is the kind of jurisprudence that is going to be dotted around all of our lessons on all of the various topics relating to both domestic and international law, as well as European law as well. In fact, what we're going to be talking about in this series of lessons is the idea of the philosophy of law or legal theory or, 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 or legal philosophy, however you want to define it, however your university defines it, however your particular textbook defines it. So we're going to be focusing on the latter of these two definitions in this series of lessons uh, and avoiding the idea of case law, talking about the idea of the philosophy of law instead. Now, Ultimately, if we go to Blackstone's uh, Law Dictionary, uh, we can see from Garner in 2009 that the concept of jurisprudence and this kind of the tradition of jurisprudence that we understand today is sort of born out of the 18th century, the 1700s. And this will become very clear when we start to look at one of our major theories of jurisprudence, this being legal positivism. Uh, we'll see that some of the most important approaches uh, from both the legal and the philosophical side of jurisprudence comes out of um, the 18th century, it comes out of the works of people like John Austin, John Stuart Mill, Jeremy Bentham, etc., uh, etc., et which are sort of, uh, it sort of bridges the gap between law and ethics, law and philosophy, law and politics. And so as a result of which, our modern understanding of, of where jurisprudence comes from derives out of the 1700s the the late eight, uh, the the 18th century should i say um and despite this however it should be noted that even though our modern understanding and the sort of development of jurisprudence comes out of this period the idea itself of jurisprudence and some of the most fundamental philosophical principles of jurisprudence pertaining to the idea of rules and the idea of laws are actually far more ancient than that. The first of our major topics on the idea of the natural law comes out of the works of individuals such as Aristotle and then into the sort of uh, Christian and the Christianization and the Catholicization of, uh, of, intellectual, uh, of academia and the intellectual movements. Um, and this is, of course, what takes place in the ancient times as we transition from ancient history into the sort of early medieval period. So even though jurisprudence is a 18th century development, shall we say, the, the theories themselves derive and are far, far older than that. Now, jurisprudence in this context would therefore be defined uh, as, say, the philosophy of law or the theory of law or legal theory, etc., etc., etc. And so for all intents and purposes, this is actually a philosophical course, but it is one that is important for any law student who is also looking to have a deeper and richer understanding of the law uh, as well. And this is really where we get into the question of why we should study jurisprudence. What is the purpose of studying jurisprudence? If you are somebody who is a law student, you might think, well, I don't really want to study jurisprudence. Um, why do I have to sit in a seminar room and discuss the philosophy of law when I could go and revise the, the, the criminal code? I can go and revise um, various tort cases. And actually, uh, these are going to be more important to me in the real world as a corporate solicitor in London. Well, in reality... And jurisprudence is very, very important. And it sort of uh, bridges the divide that we could say exists between the descriptive and the normative study of law. Because the vast majority of your studying of law, especially in law schools in and around the world, uh, as I know in great detail, is focused on the descriptive realities of law. If you are doing an undergraduate degree in law in the UK, for example, uh, you will take exams where you will just be given a problem question and you'll be told to apply the law to that problem question. It's a very descriptive endeavour. It is essentially asking you to identify the issues at hand and to apply the law to those issues. It's not particularly very normative. It is asking essentially what is the law? How does the law work? How do we apply the law? That is essentially it. Now, if you go to maybe a, a better university uh, in the United Kingdom or elsewhere around the world, you might also have the ability to challenge the fundamental nature of law. 
And one of the ways in which you can do that is through the study of jurisprudence, because jurisprudence and any other theory of law and legal theory invites us to challenge the fundamental nature of the law and ask not necessarily descriptive questions, but in fact ask normative questions. So we could be asking questions such as what the law ought to be, what should the law be, why is the law right or wrong in this particular context, why is one case here more controversial than this other case. And then the next question is, what fundamentally is the law? Now, you might be thinking, well, that's a sort of descriptive question. Uh, why, why, would I, why would I be studying that in jurisprudence? Well, when we talk about what fundamentally is the law, we're not asking the question as to what is the descriptive nature of what a particular law says. So when I say what fundamentally is the law, I'm not asking, for example, what does it say in sections 27 and 28 of the Land Registration Act? I'm actually instead talking about law as a general abstract entity. What actually is law? What does it mean for something to be law? What What is the law fundamentally at this deeper uh, and richer understanding? That is a question which is, as you can probably imagine, far more philosophical in nature. I've already mentioned the two theories that are going to be cited on this slide already, um, but I'm going to do it again just for the purposes of this particular lesson. Um, as mentioned previously in an earlier slide, I noted that despite the fact that the jurisprudence that we understand today comes out of in and around the 18th century, and that in fact the first time the, the word jurisprudence is cited in, in English language is around the late 1600s, these ideas and theories are often based on theoretical approaches to philosophy, which date back as far as the ancients, so people like Aristotle. And in, mind, in my mind, at least, there are two important theories, and this is really where we're going to spend the majority of our time studying jurisprudence. We're going to talk a lot about natural law theory, and we're going to talk a lot about legal positivism. Uh, essentially, natural law theory is where uh, seemingly a lot of the early approaches to law have uh, derived and developed. Uh, and then legal positivism is one that kind of came onto the scene and has had a huge impact and has had a huge influence over uh, all of jurisprudence to this very day. So we're going to be spending a lot of our time talking about natural law theory, legal positivism, the strengths and weaknesses of each of these theories, the history of each of these theories, as well as the variations within each of these theories coming from different philosophers. So essentially, that's going to take us to looking at the scope of this series. Now, the scope of this series is going to be looking at the following um, the following structure. Now, this is the same structure uh, as you would find in any uh, jurisprudence or philosophy of law textbook. Now, um, I'm going to be citing the, the various references and citations and bibliographies at the end of each of these videos, in the description of each of these videos. Um, I'm going to be following uh, two, three, uh, even four different um, different sources in order to, to construct these lessons. Um, but ultimately, every single jurisprudence textbook or philosophy of law textbook that I have seen, at least, um, covers these topics in roughly this order. It seems to be the standard, a bog standard order. It's the same way that, for example, negligence is the first taught that you study in any kind of taught textbook. So we're going to begin, for example, by talking about natural law theories. This is where, for the most part, people begin to talk about jurisprudence. Um, uh, on account mainly of the age of natural law theory, because natural law theory dates back, as I've said, to ancient philosophy. We're going to divide this topic into three main lessons. We're going to talk about the ancient uh, influences, the definition and origins of natural law theory. We're going to talk about the impact of Christianity on the natural law movement. So that means moving into the more medieval part of natural law theory. And then we're going to finish by looking at how natural law theory uh, influences, uh, influences and impacts uh, jurisprudence to this day by looking at some of the more modern theoretical approaches to the subject. We will then talk about arguably the most important of the jurisprudential uh, theories, depending on where you sit uh, in terms of the philosophy of law, uh, this being the concept of legal positivism. We're going to be talking uh, about um, the origins of legal positivism and the influence of uh, philosophers such as that of Austin. We'll also be talking about various critiques of Austinian legal positivism, the approaches that Austin actually took when it came to approaches relating to positivism. We will then talk about the influence of arguably 
arguably, at least in my opinion, the most important jurisprudential philosopher of all time, potentially, that being the work of HLA Hart and his approaches to legal positivism. We will then talk in the final two lessons about the critiques of legal positivism, which were levied and presented by the likes of Dworkin, and then finally the influence of Joseph Raz on the legal positivist movement. This does not mean we're going to be finished with these two theories, however, because we're going to then talk about law and society. Law and society focuses on sociological and post-liberal approaches to legal theory. This uh, means talking uh, briefly about Durkheim and Weber. Uh, Weber, not that much, given the fact that he doesn't actually cite that much uh, about law in his writings because he's a sociologist and then we'll talk about Marxist interpretations of law. We're going to keep the Marxist interpretations of law in this section um, to just the uh, traditional Marxist understanding of law. So we're going to just talk about what for example, Marx and Engels said about the legal traditions uh, within this topic, because then in the final topic, we'll talk about further alternative theories, which in, in essentially builds on those Marxist interpretations of law by talking about modern Marxist and anarchist approaches to legal thought, talking about feminist approaches to legal thought, and then building upon both of those and talking about postmodern influences on legal philosophy, which includes critical legal theory, as well as critical race theory, which is, of course, the far the most controversial of all of them, at least in recent times, um, the most controversial of all the theories of jurisprudence and the philosophy of law. This is the major structure of this series of lessons, and I want to just finally end on what is absent from this series, because despite the fact that this is a jurisprudence course, we are not going to be diving into too deep th the issues relating to the philosophy of specific areas of law. So, for example, I'm not going to talk in too much detail about the philosophy of human rights or the philosophy of criminal law. Um, this is not because they're not important, but it's because I believe they merit their own subject and conversation, their their own separate series of lessons because they are far more detailed and far more interesting and potentially after we have studied this general jurisprudence course we might go into and dive into for example the philosophy of human rights law uh, because then we can build upon our understanding that we've learned from this course and then start to talk about how that applies to those areas as well in future lessons time.